Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Niles SMA Silent Film Museum uh, and our Bronco Billy and Friends Silent Film Festival online. Got to get with the program here uh, for 2021. We're glad to have you here. And the uh, main theme of the festival is the evolution of uh, movie theaters. And um, so, of course, when we're doing that, we have to start with the Nickelodeon. Uh, so uh, I have with me here um, Dr. Russell Merritt and Dr. Frederick Hodges. So uh, I'm, in, I'm in good hands here in case I get sick. I got two doctors here. <laughs> so um, Russell and Frederick, I'm going to hand it off to you and uh, away you go. Okay. That's great. Frederick, anything you want to say? No, nope. I look very much looking forward to your presentation. And if anyone in the audience has questions, please put them in the question and answer box. And we will get to them after Russell's presentation. Terrific. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks to Rena and to the Niles SNA Film Museum. Thank you, Michael. Uh, especially uh, thanks to all of you for taking a chance on this. Uh, I'm going to minimize myself so you can see much prettier pictures. And here we go. So, uh, as you can see, I've called my talk uh, San Francisco in the Nickelodeon Age. And it's very much a follow up to the presentation that Frederick, Sean Sharp, and I gave online last January when we revisited the Nickelodeon and the art of the illustrated song. And so what I'm gonna be doing this evening is looking at what was singular about how the Nickelodeon theater developed here in the Bay Area. Now, just to be sure that we're all on the same page, uh, here's a brief review of what we mean when we use the word Nickelodeon. It is the place where movies were shown before the First World War. The Nickelodeon's heyday lasted less than 10 years uh, between 1905 and 1912, but it's of interest to us because it was the first theater specifically designed to show movies. By 1910, there were about 10,000 of them across the country. It was every, in every sense a craze. But, by the, but the first point I wanna make is that no two of them were exactly alike. I stressed in that earlier talk that they ranged from the elegant, like this, to the flea pit. They could be converted dance halls, pawn shops, cigar stores, or restaurants. Here's a Nickelodeon made from a livery stable. Or it could be a variety theater that simply decided to add movies to the live acts. Or a small theater added on to a peep show, arcade, like this. Uh, this belonged to our own Peter Bacigalupi, and it is the same kind of uh, operation that Adolf Zucker, uh, soon to create Paramount Pictures, uh, was created. And you can see he's got the automatic vaudeville, the theater on the left, how shrewd he was even uh, in this early date. So uh, what you're looking at is automatic vaudeville for one penny. What a deal. That's to see the peep show. If you wanna see a movie uh, on a screen, you go to, in that little sign below, Crystal Hall. No penny there, that was 10 cents. And that's where you got to see falsely accused cowboys race for a wife and so on. So um, these were the varieties of theaters that could be all termed Nickelodeons. Um, what movies to show, how to arrange them all, how to accompany them were all decisions left to the individual theater owner who generally improvised like mad. Uh, when San Francisco's DJ Grauman showed Melies a trip to the moon at his Empress Theater. He had actors stand behind the screen to give the movie dialogue and narration. Over in Oakland, the manager of the Hippodrome 
stood on a balcony with a megaphone to wave in his customers. Um, and then there was that revolving billboard on top of the unique theater uh, on down on Market Street. Uh, right now, we're looking at what the timetable was for the Southern Pacific if he wanted to get from San Francisco to Los Angeles with a helpful clock. But that sign could change into advertisements or to uh, coming attractions for the unique itself. Well, that was all familiar back then. But uh, what I wanted, what I paid particular attention to was where these theaters were located. Because I argued these locations were something of a surprise, an indication of where the audiences were, but even more indicators of where exhibitors looked for their audience. They were not the same thing. My most important argument was that although the Nickelodeon was famous as a working class theater, this was not the clientele the industry much wanted. Accordingly, even when they were working class entertainment, the most important Nickelodeons were seldom built in the workers' community or in their shopping areas. Instead, they customarily opened in business districts on the outer edge of the ghettos. I tried to make the case that these locations confirmed what the uh, trade journals and the filmmakers themselves made clear that the industry was after the larger middle-class family trade, currently the domain of vaudeville theaters and the legitimate stage. So consider the situation in New York's Lower East Side. Here is where we're told that the lion's share of the movie audiences came from, according to one estimate, about 77% by 1905 uh, of the Nickelodeon audience was coming from uh, a group called People Who Work, yes. Uh, so where was the Nickelodeon? Where were these theaters? Uh, were they in the heart of the Jewish part of the Lower East Side amidst the thriving open markets? In the Bowery, the oldest street in the city? How about Five Points neighborhood where the notorious Irish neighborhood once thrived but now taken over by Italians? Or how about Chinatown? That's where the audience was. Where were the Nickelodeons? Here, almost all of them outside the Lower East Side ghetto. Instead, the closest they got were in a sprinkling on 14th Street around Union Square, up to two miles away in a business neighborhood that featured upscale restaurants, department stores, vaudeville theaters, and just as important, easy subway access to the mid midtown markets. One of these 14th Street Nickelodeons belonged to William Fox, and his theater can illustrate the same point in a different way. This is a hand-colored slide uh, made from the uh, facade of the theater unique, uh, and it's part actuality and part fantasy. Uh, that's sure enough what the theater looked like, but those passers-by are a collection of actors and models. And notice how they, are, they have been fashioned. Uh, everybody's wearing a tie and a bowler, or if you're female, uh, you're in a full-length dress, a hat, and how can you miss the mother with her little girl going by uh, a box office that's been made over to look like a Renaissance confessional. Um, that is the kind of fantasy that suggests where the movies wanted to go. When those theaters were st uh, standing, um, the Nickelodeon era had barely gotten started. San Francisco was still an era of penny arcades. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I Forgot my big point. That was the uh, what a Nickelodeon theater looked like in New York. Here is what it looked like in San Francisco. When those theaters were standing, the Nickelodeon era had barely gotten started. San Francisco was still in the era of penny arcades, dime museums, and peep shows located next to vaudeville theaters 
in Lower Market Street. And here is Market Street. Uh, we're watching the famous movie that Herbert Miles made of the traffic on Market Street a few days before the great quake. And here on the right, all but invisible, is the city's first movie theater, Will First's Cineograph. Uh, across the street in the Phelan Building, the Peep Show Arcade being run by Peter Bacigalupi, uh, which is just beyond the range of our camera. Uh, here's a better view. Um, there's the cineograph uh, on the right of the Sanborn Vale building. Uh, there we go. And here's their flyer. As best I can tell, the earliest Nickelodeon advertisement in San Francisco. Here, as uh, firefighters fight the flames, you get a better view of the cineograph uh, with its fancy dome. Uh, and then uh, what's hidden right next to the cineograph is the unique Nickelodeon theater. There were lots of unique theaters in uh, this era, but it's the plain white theater that's just next to it that uh, you can see. Uh, but no matter, uh, along with everything else, the Nickelodeons are burnt to the ground and they were never returned. The earthquake and fire wiped the slate clean. Uh, theaters needed to be built afresh. So their first impulse was to build in the Fillmore, uh, sometimes called the Western Edition, uh, which had been spared the earthquake and the fire. This was a blue collar neighborhood where migrant groups predominated. Fillmore and McAllister streets were lined with Jewish owned restaurants, bakeries, shops, and kosher markets. It's where the Chutes was about to reopen. Uh, this mammoth Coney Island amusement park concentrated in a single square block. And this is where the first houses opened after the fire. But it didn't work. This may have been a working class neighborhood, but there were no legitimate or vaudeville theaters built for the movies to lean on, nor an affluent professional class. The shoots fail and so do the Nickelodeons. Instead, the movies return to Market Street between 3rd and 4th up past Powell Street. Some nine Nickelodeons by my count uh, run by the movers and shakers of the trade. Uh, so here's where the Portola Theater is built in 1909. Um, it's so large, it's double the uh, seating capacity of the ordinary Nickelodeon um, that it scarcely can be called one of those theaters. Uh, it's also where uh, Market Street's only known Nickel, uh, Nickelodeon to survive is located. Uh, this would be the Mao uh, Biograph Theater. Uh, it is, as I say, still around, but no longer exactly in mm -hmm. the movie business. Um, then around the corner on Powell Street, there is, let's see, uh, this isn't it. It is. Uh, it was, that was the uh, Edison Nickelodeon Theater. Uh, and it becomes the Powell Street Theater, which by the time it uh, ended its career in the late 70s, had become a porno house. Well, once Market Street had reestablished itself as San Francisco's Broadway, movie theaters hobnobbing with the city hotels, restaurants, and all of that, something curious happens. Unlike the major cities in the East Coast and the Midwestern states, notably New York, Chicago, Boston, St. Louis, and Philadelphia, San Francisco showed no particular interest in attracting movies from its suburbs. You can forget it if you're in Oakland, Berkeley, San Rafael, or San Mateo. The distances were too great and the public transportation too meager to attract reliable out of town clientele. Instead, the wave of the future was in the neighborhood, creating a circuit of second run and sub run theaters that could feed off the emerging Market Street moving palaces where these movies premiered. 
The large Market Street movie theaters remained a showcase for introducing silent movies to San Francisco, um, and they'll remain so uh, well into the 1950s and beyond. But the most innovative, creative developments were left to theaters in local communities, particularly uh, in the sprawling uh, Mission District, so sprawling that it's never been properly uh, located. Uh, it was all over the place, uh, but not just in the Mission District, where the largest, the largest neighborhood we're talking about, but also in the Sunset, on Haight Street, and in those environs, and in the Richmond. Now, those of you familiar with the history of our theaters are likely familiar with our pioneers. There's D.J. Grauman. He's probably best known, if he's known at all, as the father of Sid Grauman, who creates the Chinese theater and the Egyptian theater down in Los Angeles. Then there were the Nasser brothers, the Nafi brothers, Sam Levin and their brilliant architects, Timothy Pfluger and the Reed brothers. What they share in common is that they all start their fortunes with neighborhood theaters. None of them build uh, a downtown theater or a first run palace. Their empires all start in the city's outlying districts, the ones that I've identified in second run small theaters where if you were willing to wait for movies to come up to you uh, up to three months after they had ended their downtown run, you could watch them around the clock for a nickel and a dime when they'd cost you a quarter and more in a first run theater. Well, consider for example, what was happening in Eureka Valley, today's Castro. By the start of the First World War, as the Nickelodeons were giving way to larger theaters suitable for feature films, movie stars, and music ensembles, Eureka Valley was being discovered. And I mean literally discovered. It still didn't have a name. Uh, we call it Eureka Valley. That's what the businesses would uh, label it. But you can't find that name on a map of the time. You can't find it in newspapers at the time, or very rarely do you find it. But you'll find it sporadically used for business affairs. Um, now, like uh, other of these outlying neighborhoods, it had been spared the earthquake and fire. So men worked at the shipyards and the canneries or at the Southern Pacific railways where, I shouldn't say railways, they're rail yards, where the Mission Bay complex is now. So here's where the city's cops lived and it's where the city's mayor lived too. Uh, here he is, Patrick Henry McCarthy. Unfortunately, PH also stood for Pinhead and he was widely known as Pinhead McCarthy. Um, it's also where the city's Union Labor Party uh, hung around. Um, and it's why, among other things, that when Eureka Valley movie theaters had their grand openings, it was easy to round up political leaders to come and speak at their debut. Moreover, the district was enjoying a building boom that would extend well into the 20s the greatest in its history, according to the San Francisco call. Uh, in 1911, 57 new buildings were completed or in the course of construction within 30 days. Houses were cheap. You could buy a Victorian for about 600 bucks, pay it off in less than 10 years. Goats still grazed in vacant lots, but roads were being widened and getting paved. The Twin Peaks, um, here's a tongue twister, the Twin Peaks Trolley Tunnel was built in 1917, uh, and that expanded the uh, horizons of Eureka Valley, uh, something terrific. Uh, it opened up the neighborhood dramatically. It linked the valley to the beach into what were called the city's residential parks with ritzy custom homes and names like St. Francis Wood and West Portal. In short, this is a dream landscape, a dream demographic for local movie theaters. Now true, 
the stage hadn't been set by vaudeville or legitimate theaters, but it had the next best thing when it came to local entertainment. The assembly hall, suitable for dances, political meetings, union rallies, amateur theatricals, and neighborhood improvement get-togethers. By my count, there were at least four of them, all within a radius of two blocks. Uh, so here, if you can find it to the lower right, is uh, Eureka Hall at 470 Castro, where mayoral candidate Sonny Jim Rolfe spoke in 1911. Down the block, if you look to the left, a rival political group uh, supporting William Howard Taft's unsuccessful campaign for re-election uh, are meeting here at Columbia Hall. Now, uh, lift your eyes directly north, and there is Catalpa Hall on 18th and Collingwood, uh, which was the site of the Queen's Ball, part of a four-day Eureka Valley street pageant for the Eureka Valley Carnival. That, in turn, was next to Collingwood Hall across the street, where the Daughters of the Golden West threw their uh, annual dance parties and where the Eureka Valley Vaudeville Club featured, among other attractions, child wonder Baby Josephine, uh, not to mention a minstrel act and the comic stylings of Edward Healy billed as the transplanted Irishman. So could movies be far behind? As best we can tell, the first neighborhood Nickelodeon opened in 1907, less than a year after the earthquake, by the most important and certainly the most durable name in Eureka Valley entertainment, the Nasser Brothers. Uh, their Nickelodeon was called the Liberty Theater, opening at 4129 18th Street, across the street from Catalpa Hall. Uh, it was a tremendous success. And by the end of the year, the brothers were converting a second shop. This one, a clothing store, renamed the Castro Street Theater. Uh, like the Liberty, um, this theater is long gone, but the site survives as a gay clothing shop called Body. You can go inside and still see slight evidence of its uh, movie origins. It's also the Nasser Theater that we know the least about, but then again, it only lasted for two years at the most before it was turned into a roller skating rink. Has to be the smallest roller skating rink in the world. Uh, my own theory is that this theater was a placeholder, a flea pit of sorts to hold audiences while across the street, the Nassers built their first theater meant specifically for movies, uh, the second Castro, Castro II, a 400 seat gem with plush seats, ushers, carpeted floor, tasteful uh, filigree tracery on the walls, and two brand new power projectors. Not only was it the Nasser Brothers' largest theater, the Nassers were now linked to the Portola Theater District. Now today, this is the site of Cliff's Variety Store. And if you have time to go inside, you can still see traces, even just barely, of that original theater. Take a look at that archway, and then you might want to compare it with this. Um, so this is the opening night audience. The theater was important enough to have a formal premiere. There's our mayor, P.H. McCarthy, in the front row. And alongside him, members of the Eureka Valley Improvement Association. But there's more interesting news in that photograph, which we'll look at in a second. The San Francisco Chronicle claimed that by 1910, three, there were four Nickelodeons on Castro Street. By then, the Nassers had one, but I haven't been able to identify or locate the three rivals. The rival we do know about came a little later and was around the corner on Market near Noe. This was the Jose Theater of Interest. Oh, 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 um, I was going to show you uh, because who's ever heard of these theaters? The one you have heard of, uh, the one built in 1922, that's still a decade later and it's off the map, quite literally. But this is what I wanted to show you, the uh, Jose Theater of interest because it is the only photograph we have 
of what a Castro Street neighborhood Nickelodeon looked like in full regalia. Uh, now, you take a look at the changing program. Today, we have a Griffith biograph and an unidentified vitagraph. On Sunday, there'll be a Selig two-reeler set in the African wilds, then replaced with a double bill. Uh, three film programs in one week. Uh, by the way, this is the building that later becomes the home for the Names Project's AIDS quilt in the mid-1980s. And today, uh, it survives as a popular fish restaurant called Catch. That's what happens when you grow a tree and have a parklet. Uh, but if you go to Catch, you can still see the uh, panels, several panels from that AIDS quilt. Uh, you can't see anything of a Nickelodeon. But the emergence of the neighborhood Nickelodeon in San Francisco can be seen as part of a larger shift that I mentioned at the start of the talk. I've been describing the rise of the Eureka Valley theaters as part of San Francisco's emergence from the earthquake. But it can also be seen as the culmination of a movement that was starting across the country just as the earthquake hit. As you may recall, the great challenge that Showman faced was how to transform this nickel novelty into a viable staple industry. For the most important entrepreneurs, not only William Fox and Adolf Zucker, but also Marcus Lowe, B.F. Keith, and others trying to build theater circuits and distribution chains, it meant finding ways to attract that middle-class audience to a medium almost invariably identified as working class. How to lure the family trade that was so near and yet so far away, how to make the medium respectable so that people in neighborhoods would wanna go see what you had. So while San Francisco was digging itself out of the rubble, theater owners across the country elsewhere, along with the film studios and filmmakers themselves, were creating strategies that would set the table for the neighborhood theater and help it flourish. Their idea was to work through the new American woman and her children. If few professional men would as yet by 1906 consider taking their families to the Nickelodeon, the woman on a shopping break or children away from school provided the ideal lifeline to the affluent bourgeoisie. Statistically, women and children numbered only 30% of the New York audience, even less than that during the performances after eight o'clock, but they commanded the special attention of both the industry and its censors. In a trade hungry for respectability, the middle-class woman was respectability incarnate. Her very presence in the theater refuted the vituperative accusations lodged against the common show's corrupting vulgarity. Theaters spared few efforts to woo her. It just wasn't a matter of mirrors in the lobby. Uh, if we go back to those Nickelodeons on Market Street, you're gonna see something interesting. Soon after the Silver Palace established the policy of giving free admission tickets to women for pre-noon shows, Grauman's Unique down the street reacted by charging women and children half fare at all screenings and thereby set the precedent that virtually all the Nickelodeons on the block adopted. While with growing frequency, exhibitors' complaints about the movies took the form of gallant defenses of the female's tender sensibility. You can see how women played a similar role if you go to yet another San Francisco neighborhood of sorts, and this is what I'm calling the 1915 Panama Pacific International Ex um, Exposition, which was set up all along the city's marina. Now, if you were lucky enough to hear Anita Manga's presentation last March for the San Francisco Silent Film Festival about the role that film played in that exposition, you have a sense of how well documented that vast spectacle was. It lasted for almost a year and attracted 18 million people. It featured, along with an infinitude of international pavilions, 
no fewer than 60 movie theaters spread across a large amusement park called the Joy Zone. Among the visitors was a large delegation of theater owners come to attend the annual meeting of Picture Exhibitors League of America. And what was the official reason for the meeting? It was to fight the creation of a national censor board that was being threatened uh, in Congress to ensure that movies maintain standards of decency. And I'm now quoting, based on the complaints by pastors, women, and children's oversight groups, end quote. As their keynote speaker, the League heard from no less than D.W. Griffith himself, who spoke at length about the dangers of censorship and who would know better, uh, stressing the educational potential of movies if left unfettered. The talk was printed up in an illustrated pamphlet called The Rise and Fall of Free Speech in America, bristling with references to something called intolerance. So the pressure to keep movies popular was offset by pressure to keep them decent. Film uh, producers drew heavily on the literary lions. Zola, Edgar Allan Poe, Tolstoy, Dumas, Hugo, Mark Twain, and Shakespeare. At times, the tension between these two conflicting impulses, popularity and respectability, yielded bizarre results. When uh, Tannhäuser filmed Shakespeare's King Lear, the owner of the Panama Theater just off Market Street on Powell wrote to a trade journal advising exhibitors to bill Lear like a circus. It will draw bigger crowds than any film you have ever had. This wasn't as unusual as it sounds. In Boston, Louis B. Mayer showed Pathé's Passion Play, The Life of Christ from the Annunciation to the Ascension in 27 Beautiful Scenes for a Week, followed by Balal, the Demon Baboon. Both were successful. So there's much to say about these strategies, opportunistic, aggressive, hypocritical, biased, but two words may suffice. They worked. So let's go back to that audience we saw opening night at the 1910 Castro. Now, what's following, what I'm going to follow with is far from a rigorous, precise test. But my but by my informal account, the first seven rows with seven, 70 patrons close enough to be identified by gender, uh, those seven rows include more than 20 recognizable uh, well-dressed women with maybe a dozen kids, though several of them may be uh, ushers for the theater. Um, but that is an enormous percentage of women and children. This is the only unstaged photo I know of the Nickelodeon audience. And despite the special occasion of an opening night, the percentages may be telling. So as you might expect, audiences staged for illustrated songs prominently feature women, but they may not be as misleading as I once thought. So I use the 1915 uh, Panama Pacific uh, International Exposition as a useful terminal point for the Nickelodeon era in San Francisco, as the movie mad city starts building larger and larger theaters. This culminates in our Honest Mirabilis uh, 1922, when no fewer than three of the great movie palaces open along Market Street with more than 2,500 seats apiece, the Granada, the Golden Gate, and the Warfield, only to be outdone by our most famous and most durable movie house in the city, a neighborhood theater that has survived intact for almost 100 years, still showing movies. The Castro Theater also opened in 1922 amidst great fanfare. By now, its Nickelodeon roots are all but gone, but it's fair to say you could never have seen it built without its nickel theater predecessors. If you want to pay tribute to those Nickelodeon origins, the next time you visit the theater, go upstairs and sit in the seats 
that were originally installed in the Nasser's 1910 Castro, or look at the two Art Nouveau medallions on either side of the Castro stage. They are originally put, meant for the 1910 Castro theaters. Elegant ghosts, survivors from an era that was already long gone when the last of the Castro silent theaters opened its doors. Well, thanks for letting me share a part of that history. Uh, now, let me turn this over to Frederick and we can start a conversation. Thanks. Well, Russell, thank you so much for that presentation. Absolutely fascinating. Um, I have a million questions and I'm sure our audience will have some too. Um, but let me ask you to explain for us what exactly went on in terms of the entertainment in a Nickelodeon theater. Let's say 1906, not necessarily in San Francisco, but um, what was the program like that an audience could expect and how long would they sit there? Okay, the usual, again, to generalize from an improvisatory entertainment is really hard because they were all over the joint. Uh, for one thing, uh, the location and theater size would determine or help determine what was being uh, shown, how it was being presented uh, and so forth. As I mentioned, all these decisions were being made not by the filmmakers, but by the exhibitor. Uh, and so he could improvise. Um, but characteristically, when you and I put together the great Nickelodeon show and uh, gave what would be a very upscale version of the Nickelodeon, um, it characteristically joined these one and two reel movies, many of them hand colored with live acts. We had Mr. Blockhead who drove uh, four inch nails up his nose uh, with uh, illustrated songs. Uh, hand colored, beautiful. And you saw some of them in my presentation. Uh, there'd be illustrated lectures if uh, the theater was elegant enough. And uh, ours was the assassination of William McKinley and the uh, execution of his assassin. Uh, but you could find anything from a Chautauqua uh, kind of speech, you know, uh, uplifting and inspirational to a uh, speech by, or a talk by, say, a famous criminal who uh, would be doing the vaudeville circuit and the Nickelodeon circuit to uh, uh, take advantage of his fame. Um, but whatever it was, it was a place where the audience was expected to join in the entertainment, most famously with those sing-alongs where the audience was meant to join in with those illustrated uh, songs, but uh, also even with the movies. That was what popcorn and peanuts were for, to throw at the screen. And, um, and again, uh, just as the origins of these Nickelodeons are so varied, so the program would be varied. Now, the programs were continuous, weren't they? They were, yes. They never ushered the entire audience out. People just came and went as they saw fit, correct? Not exactly. They were, the Nickelodeon operators were very eager to get rid of an audience so that they could start afresh with no freebies uh, from a previous uh, uh, thing. But, but you're, the principle is correct. The lights would come out, get out, come in, and we do that from nine in the morning to midnight. Uh, Sophie Tucker is one of the famous veterans of the Nickelodeon era. And uh, she was worked mercilessly uh, by, um, let's see, who was it by? It was not by Keith, uh, oh, Marcus Lowe, and um, that, uh, he would not only have her perform seven, eight shows uh, a night but, or a day, but would have her go from one of his theaters to another where she would have to do the same thing over again. So uh, it was a rigorous entertainment, not helped by the fact that uh, 
the pianist was as often as not the owner's daughter, uh, wife, uh, an amateur. And so you had the mixture of the pros with the amateurs. You know, uh, that raises the question of how different was the entertainment offered uh, at a Nickelodeon versus a vaudeville house? Because vaudeville houses played movies as well and made that incorporated that into their shows. In fact, vaudeville theaters frequently became Nickelodeons. Um, there was a tremendous rivalry between vaudeville and the movies um, that uh, live acts felt threatened justifiably by the cheaper entertainment. And not to create such a huge gap between the two, uh, entrepreneurs who were starting with Nickelodeon theaters that weren't vaudevilles would bring in vaudeville acts, but they would range tremendously from the cheapest amateur to the Sophie Tuckers. Uh, and it all depended on where you were located, who you uh, were uh, aiming your theater at, um, and so on. So, um, uh, but, but vaudeville entertainers were always an important part. Uh, it's just what, depends on what you mean by uh, vaudeville. Um, that too was another wildly varied uh, entertainment form. Um, one thing I noticed in your wonderful PowerPoint presentation is outside many of these theaters, these Nickelodeon theaters, there were big, beautiful posters. In fact, one of yeah. our um, uh, attendees has asked a question, which I'm going to read for you. When did the Nickelodeon start using lobby cards and posters and where did they get them? Ah, that is a wonderful question. Uh, it's a wonderful question because I'm not sure of the answer. But the, um, the, 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 what came first were those huge posters and they were provided by the studio. But when the lobby cards came in, smaller, more versatile, that seems to be a somewhat later development. At least in the earliest uh, Nickelodeons I've looked at, I can't find those lobby cards. They don't come in until around 1910, 1911. And they could be provided by the studios by way of the distributor. But the act of distribution, uh, which by the way is pioneered in San Francisco by the Miles Brothers, uh, doesn't really come into play until midway through the Nickelodeon's career. That would be the obvious way to get them is from a distributor who in turn gets them from the original studio. But the details of how they were prepared and how they were marketed um, is something we still need to look at. I mean, just one visit to the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum and, and a look on the walls, you'll see enormous yes. five color lithography posters for just you know, a, a one reel film that couldn't have played more than a week in each house. The expense yeah. that they went to to advertise is-, is So just as cool. these films were bicycled, so were those accoutrements. Um, as I say, my strong impression is it starts with distribution. Um, remember the first way that you showed a movie was to buy it. That's why, you know, Grauman is showing uh, a trip to the moon, a film made in 1902. He's still showing it in 1910. He owns it and uh, he's got to find a way of getting audiences back into the theater um, where they have likely seen the film before. And you do that by ingeniously figuring out novelties. In his case, putting actors behind the screen and having them speak invented dialogue. Uh, but the same thing I think goes with posters that the very first ones would be made, I think, by the theater itself. Because as you say, the movie's only gonna be there for three days. And um, so uh, you're not gonna put a lot of money into creating it. It's when you can bicycle the posters as you can the movies that, uh, it gets more elaborate. So by the time the Biograph Company hits its stride, 1910, 1911, you don't find them in 1908 and 1909, but those posters are magnificent. 
and they're taller than I am. Um, that is a, yeah, that, that, that is a very strong development in early film. Um, uh, just a, um, a word to our audience. Uh, please put your questions in the question and answer um, folder rather than in the chat. Um, however, a, a very interesting question has arisen in the chat, which I would be very happy to read for you. Uh, this comes from Jessica Montgomery, and it says, I'm actually researching an early Nickelodeon slash movie theater owners of San Francisco. The other family business was a stationary store on Market Street. Could they possibly have done the marketing for the theaters or at least their own? They might well have done it for their own. I doubt that they would have been uh, the ones to provide posters for uh, a, a group of theaters. One way to research that is through the trade journals because the uh, folks providing posters, like those providing the slides and providing the songs, all advertise their wares. And uh, that would be a quick way to learn who the largest of these organizations were and uh, how they went about their business. But I don't want to say more than I know. And uh, that is still subject for further research. Well, one thing we do know is the large presence of advertising glass slides that were used in Nickelodeon theaters. So presumably, if you went to the theater owned by the stationary um, owners, they might have advertised their stationary store through glass slides during the program at the Nickelodeon. Possible, it's possible. So um, Russell, I'd like to ask you a, a technological question. We know that when Nickelodeon started, movies were from five to 10 minutes long because that's what you can fit on one single reel of film and most Nickelodeon theaters had a single projector. Um, but I was really fascinated to hear that you mentioned one of these theaters in the Eureka Valley advertised that it had two projectors that and was now the they could do two reelers. And you can change overs uh, seamlessly. That was the Nasser Brothers there uh, second Castro Theater on the same side of the street that their famous theater was, the one that is now Cliff's Variety Store. Yeah, they had two power projectors, brand spanking new. Uh, I suspect that their earlier two theaters uh, had nothing of the kind. It would have been exactly the format that you subscribe. One minute, please, while we change reels. And that would have been the reel. These were expensive projectors. Uh, they were imported, they were licensed, um, they, uh, and they ranged in quality. The thing about the powers is that's the, towards the top of the heap. That is a very expensive uh, 35 millimeter projector. Now, um, the business model for Nickelodeon was that you get the audience in and maybe an hour, maybe less than an hour later, you yeah. get rid of them and bring in an entirely new audience. So a constant changeover of audience, That's bringing right. in lots of money, lots of nickels. Um, but when feature films came in, obviously this was a disaster for the Nickelodeons. And would you say that it was feature films that put them out of business or was there some other economic activity that contributed to that? It's a great question. We always associate the rise of the movie palace and with feature films, movie stars, uh, and uh, a booming economy. This is we're coming into the era of the 20s. But the way you ask the question makes it more interesting and open-ended. Just because you had movie palaces, because you were starting to get larger theaters during the Nickelodeon era itself, what caused the demise of those smaller theaters? After all, uh, famously, the comedians are still making uh, one reelers. Uh, and uh, I can remember when I was a kid, not quite going back to 1910, but in, the, um, in Grand Central Station, there were theaters that you could go into to show newsreels, uh, to see newsreels. Uh, on the very principles of the Nickelodeon. There was something called the Lux Playhouse, which you could, uh, while you're waiting for your train two hours late, 
could see this thing over and over again. And um, uh, so they, they could be found, but usually uh, if San Francisco is a model, they ended up as porno houses. Um, that would be the logical uh, market for them. Um, I suppose the, the critics thought that they started as porno houses, given the yeah, yeah. censorship back then. Yeah, but, but I'm not really answering your question, which is why did they go south as the movie palaces started to take over? I would look to the economics of the industry. That is, how can you compete with uh, feature films with a nickel market, you suddenly have to raise your prices dramatically. And so the question becomes, why would anybody go to your theater uh, when they could go to a somewhat larger theater? And I think that's part of what you're seeing with the Nasser brothers is that their theaters are getting bigger and bigger and bigger to accommodate the longer movies. And the fact that movies were no longer undifferentiated. This is something very important in the development of movies. Uh, even again, in my youth, we would go to the movies once, twice a week. You know, it didn't matter what was playing. Um, it was just something you did because there wasn't that much television. So that principle starts at the very start of the Nickelodeon when it's a Nickelodeon, when it's a novelty entertainment. And so there is no particular distinction among this myriad of films that are pouring in uh, for three shows a week. One of the things about features and movie stars is that suddenly audiences are distinguishing between uh, a movie star they don't like and a star that they do. Actors they never heard of and Charlie Chaplin. That is a great driver for higher rentals and higher uh, exhibition costs. Uh, and I have an idea that that is what makes the larger theaters inevitable and prices out the uh, Nickelodeon theater. Differentiation, product differentiation. And yet you, one can imagine that uh, throughout the 20s, they were still making one real, two real comedies. You could have played those in a Nickelodeon and yeah, I think it would be hard to have had a steady diet of those and cre create a viable market. Um, that uh, it would be one thing to have a comedy as a cartoon, as something that preceded the feature, but to have a steady diet of nothing but comedies. I think today we would think of that as a delight. I think it would grow old uh, back when they were new. I suppose, yeah, there was tremendous variety in the programming in a Nickelodeon. You'd have a Western, and I'm just talking about the movies rather than the live presentations. No. You'd have, you know, something about white slavery as we saw from one of your pictures. Yes. Well, in fact, uh, that was part of the differentiation. This is the era in which genres get started. Uh, that you know, Bronco Billy Anderson is in fact a great model of an actor who finds his niche long after he started in movies. Uh, just a little footnote, we tend to think of Great Train Robbery as a Western. And the fact that Billy Anderson is in that movie reinforces that notion. That's not how it was sold. It was a crime film, crime films in the West. But the fact is those genres, they weren't even called genres, were extremely fluid and flexible. But as marketing got more um, sophisticated, genre became almost as important as uh, the movie stars. That uh, So for example, when the San Francisco earthquake hit, there was a whole genre of earthquake films. The most famous one is uh, Fatty and Mabel. Oh, oh uh, no, um, <laughs> they do go to the earthquake, but the famous one is when they go to the fair. But there's lots of movies that are uh, set around the catastrophe of the San Francisco earthquake, um, uh, almost a fad more than a genre. But you're getting the idea that that's how you can, you know how to market these films. Uh, Western's tremendously popular.
uh, slapstick comedies, tremendously popular, spy dramas, especially during the First World War, enormously popular. And, uh, and so it went. You know, um, I'd like to ask you, uh, just as an aside, do we have any idea how many Nickelodeon theaters existed in San Francisco pre-earthquake or after the earthquake? Oh, in San Francisco, I have a national figure. No, I don't know. It, it would probably be well over a hundred, but the guy who would know is Jack Tilmany. Uh, Jack, Jack has written the authoritative booklet on Nickelodeons, uh, yeah. but it extends up until uh, the end of the silent era. Uh, we have lots of authorities on the numbers of uh, Nickelodeon theaters. I am not one of them. And, uh, now we know in the uh, in the big studio area era of the late twenties and thirties, wow. theaters would not only would be owned by a particular movie um, studio, but they might also be uh, independent theaters that had contracts with various yeah. providers so that they would play a certain type of movie. Um, do you think in the Nickelodeon era, the Nickelodeon theaters had relationships with certain studios such as Vitagraph or SNA? I think you put your finger on something I ignored in explaining, trying to explain how uh, uh, the Nickelodeons got snuffed by larger theaters which is no, they did not have contracts with studios. It was a free market at its most brutal. What happens with the development of block booking and of these other, and the acquisition of theaters by studios is that's when those, um, those um, relationships develop. And in fact, we have it backwards. It was the great theater chains the one Marcus Lowe is the most famous, but also the Fox. They start with theaters and now they need movies. And so they build their own theaters. And so MGM is created to provide material for uh, the Lowe's theater chain. The Fox theaters get Fox movies. They are not exclusive contracts. Uh, theaters are showing movies from all over the, the working place. But uh, there are special relationships, special deals, special bargains. You know, we're opening the big parade. Uh, you as a Lowe's theater will get a special discount uh, for showing this, but we're expecting more marketing, more uh, tie-ins uh, and uh, will make it worth your while. That does not exist in the Nickelodeon era. That is something that comes with uh, the major theaters. And I, I suspect that in the days that follow, uh, other speakers will uh, get involved in that. So the studios didn't mind if uh, the same theater played uh, films from their rivals. Like they might play an Edison, an SNA, Vitagraph, oh. Biograph, one after the other, no, nobody cared. Did you notice that in the marquees that we were showing those law, the, the, you know, the outsides of the theaters, that that was a selling point. We mentioned movie stars as, um, you know, uh, an object of differentiation. In the Nickelodeon era, it was the studios. Uh, I'm gonna show a Vitagraph, I'm gonna show a Biograph, I'm gonna show a Lubin, I'm gonna show an SNA. Um, because as often as not, you didn't know who the actors were. And um, so, yeah, the, and that's the way the studios wanted it. They, uh, they're, they're famous for keeping secret uh, the names of their performers. And uh, Biograph seems to have been the breakthrough studio. Now, um, you are a, a world authority on W.D. Griffith. And um, his first feature came out in the year features were invented, 1913, Birth of a Nation. Um, that's still the Nickelodeon era. Where did he show that film? Okay, first, um, it's D.W. And he starts in 1913, not with Birth of a Nation, but with a movie called Judith of Bethulia. And that is just a great story for our point because uh, it's Griffith who is pushing for longer and longer movies. The studio hates it that uh, they want the movies shorter because, <laughs> uh, 
where's the where's the money in uh, producing a longer movie that you're going to have to charge the same rental or purchase price for? And so Griffith had all kinds of tricks to get the movies longer while resisting the studio. One is he had Billy Bitzer crank faster so that the movies would uh, be extended. The, you know, oh, these were... Uh, projectors on rheostats so you could regulate the speed of the projector and we did some research on this and you would sometimes have to go down to 12 frames a second for a Griffith biograph when the standard rate was around 15 or 16 frames a second and uh, so then when uh, two reelers that is 20 minute films would come into play Griffith was chafing at the bit and yeah, so that's where respectability versus popularity comes in. If you're going to break through with a new length of film, you make it a prestige product. What better than a Bible story, literally an apocryphal story, Judith of Bethulia. And then it is not Griffith, but the foreign producers that are pushing the envelope, Kabiria and uh, Fall of Troy. Uh, these are five reels and six reels. Where are you gonna show them? And so they've gotta go into those larger theaters or into legitimate theaters where it was unusual to show a movie and that made them even more prestigious. Uh, so those are the factors that lead to the longer films. And of course the punchline is the birth of a nation. Uh, there's been, there's nothing like that either for its racism or for its importance in the development of uh, motion picture craftsmanship. Uh, that extends to the, um, to the marketing of it. Uh, and he got Nickelodeon operators like feature film, uh, you know, longer theater operators furious at him because he, he debuted his films entirely in legitimate theaters. You had you know, two a days, uh, 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 illustrated programs, uh, reserve seats. You know that, that's miles away from anything the Nickelodeons knew about, and it was not common. In fact, I don't know that it was even possible with uh, feature film uh, theaters uh, as early as 1915. It would come, but uh, they were, but those roadshows, as they were called, were all fodder for legitimate houses, not for feature film houses. Not for Nickelodeons. Um, and certainly not for Nickelodeons, no. <laughs> so I wonder, um, did the Nickelodeon theaters look at the advent of features as a threat? Or uh, did they not realize that it was a threat and just continue to imagine that they would be able to supply audiences with endless years and years, decades of one reelers. These are sharp people. These are smart cookies. Um, they see the handwriting on the wall. Remember, it's a fly-by-night business. Um, I mentioned that many of these Nickelodeons start as beer parlors, cigar stores, pawn shops, easy come, easy go. I'm impressed by that 1907 uh, 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 Nasser Brothers Castro Street Theater. Uh, it begins as a clothing operation. It becomes a roller skating rink. Uh, no, easy come, easy go. No one's expecting uh, a long life in these theaters, but boy, can you make a lot of money uh, while the going is good. It's interesting that the Nasser Brothers um, started out building Nickelodeons, and I guess built a reputation so they were able to um, get capital to build b big palaces later. So obviously they were in it for the long run, but I wonder yeah, how- They were, and the Nafee brothers were in it for the long run. They, uh, they no, they, uh, there was a reason they are considered the, the, the cream of the crop. They, they, they saw things uh, beyond uh, a get rich quick scheme. And uh, you're absolutely right that, what they both have in common, and the Graumans have the same thing in common, uh, is that they see the future uh, and can act on it. And the financing is very interesting. Don Nasser, who's still very much around 
and is in charge of the Castro Theater today. It's gonna to reopen by the way, in the fall. Um, he might have some insight into how those original theaters were financed. Um, and, um, but that family is a great illustration of the flexibility and versatility and the sheer hard work of uh, running these theaters. By the 50s, when the Castro, the famous 1922 Castro is on the skids, they figure, you know what the future is? It's not in more theaters, it's in production. So they go and buy the, uh, the studio that is owned by Jimmy Cagney's brother and they do something that is considered heresy. It's worthy of a fatwa in the entertainment business. They start uh, renting it out to TV producers when TV was at war with Hollywood. And so that's where everything from the Lone Ranger to uh, Our Miss Brooks to I Love Lucy all get filmed uh, is in our own Nasser Brothers uh, studio. Then when Mel Novikov takes over the theater and turns it around again, a new era begins where it's a repertory theater and uh, that's where it is today. Um, but um, uh, no, the whole secret is remaining flexible and uh, going with new directions. It's a very trendy business. Only the recording business, I think, and you would know all about that, is uh, trendier uh, and, uh, uh, and more quick to, to change. I should think that movies would be even quicker because, you know, in the Nickelodeon era, any particular movie wouldn't be shown for more than a couple days. And even in the, the talking, well, not, well, in the 20s, during the, the giant movie palace era, a, a successful movie that was considered, you know, a blockbuster would only play a week That's at the true. most. But the marketing of those, the, uh, of those films, the way in which they were presented, that was not quickly turned over. Uh, the famous technological innovations come at, according to recording industry standards, at a slow rate. Consider the distance between 78s, 45s, uh, uh, you know, uh, CDs and the rest, boom, 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 uh, much faster than something uh, equivalent in the movies. The era of the talkie, the widescreen, the, uh, the modern digital formats. Uh, no, but of course the movies are examples of here today, gone tomorrow. Um, and now we don't sense that, but it is remarkable how disposable these movies were uh, back in the silent era uh, and the rest. I can tell you a personal story about that. Uh, in days gone by, I was directing something called the Wisconsin Center for Film and Theater Research. And one of our great acquisitions was the, uh, the United Artists Collection it was a combination of Warner Brothers and RKO films. And the reason you and artists was so generous in donating them to us was that there was no future in them. Um, that, uh, you know, they're dead to us. They are called vaulties and there's no market for them. Uh, I think I'm giving away my age. Uh, and uh, so here we were sitting on them when suddenly this market not for TV, well, for TV, but especially when the uh, videotape market comes in, suddenly uh, United Artists does a great uh-oh <laughs> and uh, needs to recalibrate uh, the value of its vaults. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, Indeed, we're lucky that any films survive from the first oh. half of the 20th century because, again, the, once they were shown, had their one week run, that was it. They had no future. Oh, so why okay. pay the money to store them? To tell you the truth, that era has not entirely passed. It's one of the frustrations of these ma mammoth takeovers. So, for example, the one that I'm most involved in 
not that I had anything to do with it, was the uh, Disney takeover of uh, 20th Century Fox. First thing they do is uh, change the name of 20th Century Fox. It's no longer got Fox's name in it. Um, who the hell was he? And the second thing they did was fire everybody associated with the Fox archive so that there's nobody tending the store for those classic Fox films, whether it's Young Mr. Lincoln or um, oh, uh, 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 any of the John Ford classics. Um, but everything is devoted to the Star Wars uh, era and its um, descendants. So uh, that notion that if it's old, how can it possibly be useful uh, has not passed. And when I say I'm involved, what we're involved in is trying to uh, get Disney to reconsider and to uh, keep the uh, restoration programs for these Fox films uh, active. And um, we shall see. Well, I wish you all the luck in the world on that. Yeah, I know. As in lots of luck. Yeah, that's right. It's important to you and me that these films, that our history survive, but someone has to pay for it and the studios don't want to, even though they own the properties. Right. Uh, no, it's basically a, uh, an archive and museum and art house film uh, industry. Uh, it's certainly not uh, anything that we're looking forward to from theaters, but we're hoping that the digital market and the streaming market would be flexible enough to make it worth the studio's while. But in any case, that's for another Bronco Billy session. <laughs> well, now um, I'd like to address the topic of modernity, but uh, really it's scientific technology. When movies started in the Nickelodeon era, they weren't quaint and old timey. They were the ultimate in modern science and technology. Um, did they advertise themselves as this brand new um, entertainment medium or did they try to integrate themselves in more traditional forms of entertainment such as the stage? Yeah, it, no, it's a good question because I think both aspects are true. When they are presented at the Panama Pacific Exposition, that was as an example of the brave new world of modern technology. And they certainly had that reputation of being another wonder along with the telephone and with uh, the light bulb, you know, just all the, and the phonograph particularly. Um, that was a, cons a considerable part of their appeal. You've never seen anything like this, but it does go hand in glove with this effort at working up, not just plays and vaudeville sketches, but even opera. Uh, back as early as 1906, they are trying to marry the uh, recording industry to the motion picture industry. It doesn't work, but it, it's a sign of the direction they wanna go into. Uh, the tech and the evolution of the technology is something that gets widely uh, promoted. Uh, our projector is better than yours. Uh, we have a better film gauge than you. And then the, uh, and uh, we keep on forgetting, I certainly keep on forgetting how important Europe is to, as a prod to the latest technology. There are these great rivalries that um, also affect the technological drives, but they're quiet. They're not anything like the coming of sound or you know, the coming of uh, the videotape. They are things that, oh, you know, the better example would be there, what you find in animation. When you go to a Pixar film 10 years ago to a Pixar film today, you're aware that, boy, something's different. The movie might not be better, but the image seems clearer or more precisely, the animation seems more complex. It's those gradual kinds of small improvements that were driving the movies almost from the beginning. The way a scene was lit, the, 
the way uh, it was staged. Those were all fiercely competitive aspects of films. You know, and, and speaking of the technological innovations, I mean, one of the very first filmmakers in France, Georges Méliès, he wasn't relying on uh, opera or Shakespeare yeah. or famous novels for his movies. Instead, he exploited the trick photography that was suddenly possible, something that could never be done on the stage. And here he was doing that. But I'm, I'm curious to know if you thought why those sort of trick photography films really become quite rare. I mean, they were oh. done throughout the Nickelodeon era. Yeah. Were they? Um, they were part of that fad that we were talking about. They come and they go. And Melies is a kind of sad case in that regard. If you've ever seen Hugo, the Scorsese film, uh, he's, uh, he considers himself out of, a dinosaur out of the Jurassic era. Uh, he in fact burns all his films in order to avoid Pathé taking them over. And the only reason that we have them is because his, um, oh, his, his, his rascally brother, uh, Gaston, uh, was getting duplicate uh, prints for the American market. And instead of destroying them as he was instructed, he kept them for another day. And the history of how they get to UCLA and then to the Library of Congress is just one of the wonders of uh, how bad behavior creates a wonderful result, uh, a lesson for us all. So the, um, uh, but for Mel, yes, it was natural. He was trained as a magician and to see this as a trick medium. And, you know, magic acts back in those days had narratives. They, uh, you didn't just pull rabbits out of the hat. You had a cast of characters that would do magical things, usually catch on fire or uh, uh, multiply. And that was all done on stage, but how much cooler to do it on a film. And as you see, there's a great break in Melies's films. He made hundreds of them, uh, but from those simple vaudeville kind of turns to the narrative, that actually is a return to the classic training as a magician that he had. Um, and uh, so he's, if, if anybody's ever heard of Robert Hou Robert Houdin, um, he was the great model for uh, Mel, yes. Well, uh, you know, Houdini made movies and yet the ones I've seen, he doesn't do magic tricks. He's just no. a, a character in adventure films. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He, exactly. You know, he doesn't do magic tricks. <laughs> well, uh, and yet it's so, it just, I'm still curious whether American filmmakers ever attempted to do the trick films in the style of Méliès. I can't think of any offhand uh, because the French had so sewn up the market. It wasn't just Méliès, but there was uh, uh, Segundo, uh, Zecca, did magic tricks for a while. Paul Durand uh, did trick novelties. Uh, no, and in fact, they had the great advantage of a studio that uh, would hand color their films. That was not so unusual with French films as it was with American films. We would tint them, but we wouldn't hand color them. And uh, so, fantasy, uh, magic acts, that was all considered part of the French legacy. And uh, so I, so offhand, I can't think of an American that did. It doesn't mean that they weren't, but uh, certainly the best known of all French. Indeed. Um, in the American uh, market, I'm curious to know the, about the films that D.W. Griffiths made these little morality plays, obviously brand new stories that either he created or his scenario writers did. How successful were they with the American audiences? Oh, they were cutting edge. Uh, he, he, did, he made 485 films in five years. 
that's at a rate of two and three a week at the start. And uh, at the time he entered the movie industry, Vitagraph was the studio to beat. By the time he left Biograph, Vitagraph was left in its dust and uh, Biograph just ruled. You got higher rental rates from a Biograph film. Uh, you got recognizable movie stars, first Marion Leonard, then eventually Mary Pickford, uh, Blanche Sweet, uh, and you've got D.W. himself, this absolutely extraordinary director of one and two real films. Um, as I say, 485 of them. Uh, and it's as though each, especially towards the end of that part of his career, they look like they're handcrafted. You know, you'd ex as you'd expect when you're doing two and three a week, some of them he would just phone in. But that was less and less true by uh, the end of his career. Not the end of his career, but the end of his biograph career. And uh, that's, of course, what set him up to become a director of feature films, is uh, if he couldn't do it, nobody could. And so he was given the choice projects and given the choice contracts. It was one of the ways I, I didn't, I, I mentioned this when I gave the talk in, um, uh, at, at Niles uh, back in January, and I didn't have time for it today, but you know, one way that movies were getting tilted towards the middle class was through the filmmakers themselves. And Griffith is the primary example of that, but he's by no means alone. He was making as much money as a Supreme Court justice by the time he left Biograph. Not as much as the president, but um, you know, not working class uh, uh, material. And so, uh, and he's telling stories that are appropriate to that class. Uh, uh, now true, Griffith would make films about migrants and about working class people, but he's unusual that way. Uh, you know, those filmmakers are coming from a much different background than from the Nickelodeon operators and from the distributors and the movies show it. Now, um, in the newspapers, they would, uh, for vaudeville houses, they would advertise the acts. And if they were playing movies, they would advertise the movies. Yeah, yeah. I assume that Nickelodeons would also advertise in the newspaper. And if they did, would they just simply list the title or would they list a D.W. Griffith's name as well, the auteur of the film? That's a bunch of questions. Mostly they didn't advertise because they didn't need to. Um, they were getting their audiences through word of mouth. When they did advertise, it would be generic. I mentioned you'd publicize the studio, not the performer. Why would you want to give them, why would you want to tempt them by asking for more money? Um, no, they were important because they were part of an ensemble. And that was the biograph principle as well. That is Mary Pickford could be a lead one week, she could be an extra the next week and so on. That was true of them all. And in other studios, uh, I'm thinking of Lubin and SNA, uh, there was no distinction between an actor and uh, uh, a stage manager that, you know, they would lift furniture, they would uh, write scenarios, they would do everything with a jack of all trades. It was very much a family, uh, that's maybe a little cozier than it was, but but it was but it's a but it was an ensemble affair, and um, so, but again, Griffith is different that uh, they don't know who is directing the biographs until 1912. Now he's been directing for since 1908, but uh, uh, once they find out who it is. Um, his name is just below the biograph marquee. Um, but even in you know, those huge posters that we talked about, you don't see his name. You just see the biograph name and the title of the film. And um, so uh, that's how they got marketed. And then, but advertising in newspapers, that's one of the great frustrations for anybody researching this stuff. Uh, it's really hard to know. Uh, if you don't have the photographs, what 
movies these theaters are showing and how long they would last. The good news about Biograph is that we have these company records that will tell you, but they're not gonna go theater to theater to theater. Um, they just give you a general sense of when they were released, when they were returned and so on. But um, uh, no, well, no. That, that brings up another issue. Um, did Nickelodeon theaters rent the films or did they have to purchase them? They start by purchasing, they then rent them. That's when the Miles Brothers get so important because they create the distribution patterns that others would follow. Now, the distributors, did they purchase the films from the studios and yes. then rent them or did the studios rent to the distributors? No. Um, no, the, the rental to distributors doesn't come until even later. No, distributors, the Miles Brothers bought the films and then they would distribute. They would show them first in their own theaters and then they would circulate them. But uh, no, I don't know. No, I, I've never seen an ad uh, from a film producing company in that period that offered to rent a film even to a distributor, you bought it outright, but who, you, but who bought it? That was what was changing. And you bought it, by the way, by the foot, another way in which the product was not differentiated. Uh, and uh, so, and what distinguished, let's say, oh, I'm making up these numbers, but say 10 cents a foot to 15 cents a foot or whatever the numbers were, uh, was not you know, who was in the movie. It was whether it was color or, or not. Technical things that would make the big difference. The difference wasn't the studio, like Edison didn't charge more or less than Lubin? I don't believe so. I, those are, the ones I've seen are awfully consistent rates. No one's trying to cut prices with the, uh, uh, with the sale. Now, um, you've probably seen every possible one reeler film that still exists, no. um, more than most people. Um, no, 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 I mean, there is an extent to masochism. And uh, <laughs> no, no, not every, no, every one reeler that survives. Well, but you must have a sense of the quality of these yeah. um, films. What can you tell us about the quality? how many surprises there are. No, there is a nice low standard where they're just cranking it out. But then you are just amazed at the quality of uh, individual titles. Uh, the mo I think the best Nickelodeon film ever made was by Lois Weber, and it was called Suspense. And we used it in our Nickelodeon show. Uh, and the Griffith films, but also, uh, oh, there's an Edison film and I'm blocking on its exact title, Something Beyond Sunset, uh, which is just haunting. It is so touching uh, about a newsboy who decides to commit suicide. And uh, there, as I say, and the serials, which you would think would be, you know, the lower end of the uh, spectrum, uh, were in fact wonderful, some of them. They're showing one right now at the uh, uh, Bologna Film Festival, the Ritrovato, and uh, it's, it's a nail biter. And Fouillade, another French director, uh, can, he's the one who does the Fantomas and the Judex and all those great action packed serials. Uh, they're always surprising you by their sophistication. And uh, so, but they are surprises. You aren't expecting uh, great individuality. You're uh, expecting uh, something rapidly produced, rapidly disposed of, and rapidly replaced. And yet there is so much uh, great art created under that system. It's Think of comic strips. Who would have thought that we would have masterpieces in daily newspaper comic strips? Uh, they are the ultimate in fish wrap. You just, you, except that the colors could bleed, but 
no. Uh, art is extremely treacherous that way. There are no guarantees uh, and no reliable way of predicting. And boy, is that true of the Nickelodeon movies. Uh, you can't rely on reviews. You can't rely on popularity. Uh, there's just too much uh, art in, which is an equivalent of unpredictability uh, in, uh, in these works. Would it be safe to assume though that all the little films that Griffith made for the Nickelodeon market are masterpieces or are a cut above? <laughs> no, 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 no. Those I have seen all of them. I have seen all of those Griffith films and because uh, they almost all survive. So I should have said all the surviving ones. No, no, no. Masterpieces are not the words I would use for a lot of them. He is making them at this extremely fast rate. But the surprise is that in the midst of this helter skelter, you come up with these gems where you least expect it. Have you ever seen a film called Corner and Wheat? That is a film that was made, uh, one of four films made that week. And it is a jewel. And it doesn't hurt that it was based on a story uh, written by a San Francisco writer, Frank Norris. And uh, it was called, the original was called The Deal in Wheat. It is haunting. He is cross cutting like you wouldn't believe. that doesn't cut it for me as much as how he cross cuts between how wheat is used in the stock market, how it's grown, how it's served at home, and uh, what happens to uh, those in the chain of how the wheat gets from the field to your dinner plate. Uh, Astonishing, 1908, you don't expect a film like that. And uh, his very first film, Adventures of Dolly, is a wonderful, taut, last minute rescue film. Now, it's gonna get blowback because it involves gypsies and all the stereotypes associated with gypsies. But just in terms of a dramatic adventure, uh, it has a lot to teach. You know, um, one of the, you mentioned Lois Weber. Yeah. And um, I worked on a, a DVD project of several of her films. And I wonder if she was known at the time by audiences or whether they didn't care who the director was. They don't care who the director is. And if they did care, they would get misinformation. She was married to a fellow named Philip Smalley. And he took all the credit for the work, for directing her films. Uh, and uh, so, no, she doesn't come out from under the, uh, uh, the shadows uh, until much later. Uh, she becomes a feature film director and a very good one. But uh, no, in the Nickelodeon days, you would have no way of knowing unless you were an insider for those studios that uh, she was doing the work. Uh, by the way, she was handsomely paid um, for it, but uh, you know that still survives today. These authors who will just use their initials for their first name because they don't want to be identified as women. Um, that was that same principle. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, she, um, she was part of that era. Um, it would be difficult, however, for audiences not to notice some of the stars and become attached to them. Yes. And I, I'm curious about that process, like Chaplin's first films for Keystone. Clearly that's, it's the Nickelodeon era, that's where they would have been seen. I, I worked on that big DVD project and for the first time saw all of those films and mm -hmm. was struck by how, you know, they're not all masterpieces. Yeah. Uh, and yet, he became a star in that oh, era, yeah. playing different characters. He didn't always do the the tramp character. How did how did he become a star? 
Well, consider, consider the competition. Um, there were gifted comedians, including ones that he worked with, but there was nobody as original as Chaplin at that time. Uh, of course, these days we tend to favor Buster Keaton uh, and then my parents would favor Harold Lloyd, uh, but neither of them had the iconic presence that Chaplin had. Um, and uh, it is of course the complicated personality that he can develop in the tramp. And that is another feature of what you've been trying to describe, which is that when you're making that many movies, you have room to experiment, to improvise, to hone your craft. Today, we tend to do it on television, I suppose, but uh, back then it was all done for the movies. The thing about Chaplin is lightning strikes so early in his career. Uh, and so you're now impressed by how much better he got from one studio to another. But back then it was magic almost from the beginning. And that was not true of other comedians. The closest might have been Roscoe Arbuckle, but uh, even he didn't have anything like the popularity of Chaplin. And uh, as I think W.C. Field puts it best, he's a goddamn ballet dancer. <laughs> Well, obviously, Chaplin uh, became world famous for a good reason. He certainly deserved it. He had a, a magnetism on film that, you know, I guess all movie stars have to have that same magnetism, but his is, was stratospheric. I know um, in, I've done research on movies in San Francisco in the 20s. Yeah. And most films, as I mentioned, played only three days, and that was fine. People made a lot of money. Studios were happy. Uh, a blockbuster hit might play an entire week. Yeah. And if it were really successful, it might then be sent to a move over house, a smaller neighborhood theater and play a little more there. And, but that was all anybody could hope for, except for Chaplin. In the uh -huh. 20s, his film, The Kid, for instance, played for months in San Francisco. Oh. And The Gold Rush played for months in the same theater. And no movie star, no movie ever had that kind of treatment. And, and audiences filled every theater, every showing of his films. It's just astonishing how much he was loved. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, that is why the, the fall, if that's the right word, was so dramatic. The Little Tramp? is involved in political issues, uh, there was considerable outcry against that. But it was only because, you know, we thought we knew you. And suddenly, uh, I mean, when you go from that adulation that you mentioned to Monsieur Verdue, which was not even released in San Francisco, be, and it hadn't been released, it might not have been released in the United States. I'm not sure of that but it certainly was not released in the big cities uh, because it was considered so inflammatory. Um, that is a shift. And uh, so, but you're right, in the twenties, none of the people that we put up against Chaplin uh, came even close. The thing about Harold Lloyd was that whereas Chaplin was making what, three films in the twenties, Lloyd was pounding them out, you know, one a year and more. And so he was seen by more people just because of the output. But uh, it made the event of a Chaplin film even more special. Um, and uh, yeah. Indeed. And, uh, but I guess in the Nickelodeon era, there were no event films. That, uh, they yeah. weren't advertised as I, 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 so the event films were weird in that they were the ones that created scandal. The event film, for example, that really attracted attention uh, in the Nickelodeon era in San Francisco 
was the uh, Jack Johnson, Jim Jeffries fight, uh, mainly because Jack Johnson won. <laughs> and um, that uh, this was considered an immoral film. And so, but the thing was that theater owners who showed it uh, couldn't keep audiences away. It was a tremendous hit. So what you'd have, it started with a theater called the Valencia, was that the theater manager would show it, the cops would show up, arrest him, and he would be out in a couple of days. And uh, meanwhile, the film would just, and they try to stop the film, but they would be way, that was how he got arrested, is that he would show it anyway, or he would have secret screenings of it. And then it would just be bicycled all over the city. And the cops were just doing what they could to keep up with it and arresting and even interrupting performances. Now that was an event and, uh, and the trade papers just picked it up and wouldn't let it go. There were multiple arrests. Uh, and then you, you mentioned inside the slave, white slave traffic. Uh, that was another one that got women's groups in particular up in arms that uh, this was uh, a study of prostitution that was inappropriate for family audiences and they would try to shut the theaters down. And I mentioned just the tip of the iceberg when mentioning the league at the Panama Pacific uh, International Exposition uh, with this huge war between uh, the censors or would-be censors and the film industry, both of them heavily represented by women. Um, and, um, and the way it was navigated, um, we never got a national censor board, to my mind, very good. We did get this national uh, board of review, which was a self-policing uh, censorship uh, group, but it didn't have any teeth in it for my money, good. But then you had this forest of state and municipal censored boards, uh, dominated by women, by the way, um, who uh, would have different rules for different municipalities. Now, you would imagine that San Francisco, wide open San Francisco, would have no trouble with city municipal censors. Ha! There were all kinds of efforts at trying to, if not prevent a screening of a given film, trim it so that the uh, offending parts would be missing. Um, I went to school in Boston and that was still the practice uh, back there. Dance numbers would be mercifully amputated uh, because the wiggles got too provocative. And uh, well, in, in San Francisco, uh, when the gold rush was playing, uh, as you may know, uh, at the end of that movie, uh, Chaplin and the girl kiss. Oh, that's there was a big article front page of the San Francisco examiner showing that some censor, I don't, I can't remember who decided that that kiss scene was too long. And apparently the, in the original, it was like 13 seconds long and he decided no kiss should last that long. That's immoral. <laughs> so he, and there's a picture in the newspaper of him scissoring the, <laughs> the film so that the kiss only lasted three or four seconds. Their ways are not our ways. Um, no, I, uh, no there, there's a lot of silliness, of course, connected with that. There is some much greater moral ambiguity when you come to a film. I was going to say like Birth of a Nation. There's no film like Birth of a Nation uh, where the easy anti-censorship arguments that we make suddenly get complicated. Uh, and, um, and of course, today, it's almost impossible to show the film. But even back then, the film was always controversial. In fact, that's why it was made, because it was controversial. And Griffith wants to start with a big splash. But uh, the... Uh, it, if you want to say that at work, it certainly did what he wanted it to do. It made him anathema. Um, and um, so uh, the strategies that 
what we would call censor groups, that would be the NAACP, the National Urban League, and these other uh, progressive groups had a major conundrum um, how to deal with this film when they were utterly powerless in the greater affairs of society. What could they reasonably expect to do uh, with these scenes that were so offensive? And that's where this issue of censorship is complicated because you have the, these groups strongly advocating for censorship of films. And it is not easy to provide the arguments that they should not be heard. Um, and uh, so, but there were champions of the film that create very powerful arguments. Um, Intolerance, by the way, the film that came comes in right after that also ran into major censorship problems. And, uh, but it wasn't, we're not gonna show the film. We're just, as you say, we're gonna edit it and uh, take out the good stuff. So uh, that was Griffith being his crafty self. Uh, he would put in scenes that he knew would be taken out and then raise a hullabaloo. Look at what, what I'm being crucified for. And uh, so, um, well, it just goes to show that in the Nickelodeon era, the beginning of film history, there were tremendous talents, authors, auteurs, I should say, and brilliant people making all kinds of movies that shook up society. And yeah. we're still I, really- I, That's a great point. That, that is, I think, the great one of the great contributions of the Nickelodeon. It starts, uh, an era of social issues. There are lots, not so much of political films, but socially aware films, um, factory conditions, child labor, women's rights, uh, the whole menu of progressive uh, politics can be found in these films. They're not always on the right side, especially when it comes to women's suffrage, but they are and, and certainly, I mean, racial equality is off the table, but uh, it is remarkable how active they were. And in fact, I think one of the ways that movies step backwards is from this activist uh, uh, era in movie making to the entertainment era of the 20s when following the change from Woodrow Wilson to Harding and Coolidge and Hoover, uh, suddenly politics and social issues uh, are subordinated to sheer entertainments that have almost no recognizable political dimensions. Uh, it is, uh, to, to, it would be great had more of our first class directors from the 20s started to engage more with uh, social issues. Uh, certainly some did. And Kevin Brownlow has written a book about social involvement in the 20s, but it is, uh, he does not write thin books, but this is a thin slice of the 20s compared to what it would have been had he written the same kind of book for the Nickelodeon era. Well, perhaps he's working on that now. But um, Russell, I have had such a wonderful time talking to you. You're absolutely fascinating, a, a fountain of tremendous and important knowledge. I wanna thank you so much for sharing uh, your expertise with us today. Oh, well, thank you, Frederick. It's been an absolute pleasure, as it always is in getting together with you. Uh, we will see each other soon. I hope so. Michael, would you like to say a few words to our audience? Uh, yes. Well, thank you both so much for all of this knowledge. This has been great. A couple of personal little things. You know, as some of you may know, I'm one of the tour guides at, in our uh, Niles SMA Silent Film Museum. And I'm telling people that um, our theater in the back was built during the Nickelodeon era. And I generally have to explain 
uh, the word to them because people think that a Nickelodeon is something that you drop a nickel into, <laughs> um, like a slot machine or a jukebox. If anybody knows that song, hit song from 1950, I found out by Teresa Brewer uh, called Music, Music, Music. Uh, so uh, I, I also tell them, and I hope I'm getting this right, is that the word is actually a combination of, of course, nickel was the admission and odeon was the Greek word for theater. And now, uh, Michael, we're showing our age. I think Nickelodeon for X kids has to do with a TV show. Yes, somebody would say that too. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like I said, it's come to mean other things over the years, So, uh, but it's up to us to set them straight. You got it. Yeah. By the way, while we're talking about tours, uh, let me highly recommend Michael's tours and also recommend the San Francisco City Guides tour of uh, uh, the motion picture history. Uh, it was created by Rory O'Connor and uh, you can find out when it starts but I found it fascinating. He doesn't go back to our era. He starts with the 20s. And, but what a great location uh, uh, San Francisco was for movies. Yes. Now, Russell, you have done reenactments of Nickelodeon shows in our theater before. Uh -huh. And um, hopefully you'll be doing them again sometime. Now, our store and museum are open once again, Saturdays and Sundays from noon to four. And we expect at the moment to open our theater sometime in the fall, maybe late September, early October. And would love to have you back sometime, Russell, to do another well, show. Thank you. It's a very kind invitation. Yeah. And uh, Frederick, uh, of course, Frederick is one of our pianists for our weekly silent films. Be uh, really nice to have him back too to uh, talk to talk with uh, <laughs> and uh, hear his uh, great piano playing. Thank um, you. Uh, I always li like to say, um, uh, often imitated, never duplicated. <laughs> so again, thank you all so much for this great show. And to all of you out there, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of our Bronco Billy and Friends Silent Film Festival online. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, Michael. Thank you, you everybody. Take care.